Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the In Her Own Right Symposium. My name is Beth Lander and I'm the Managing Director for the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries, through which In Her Own Right was created. Welcome to this session, which examines women as peacemakers. I will be introducing both speakers at the beginning of the session, so one will follow the other immediately. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end of the presentations. First, a few housekeeping notes. During this session, we have disabled chat for attendees and are using it only as a way to send messages to all of you. So if you have questions for the panelists or if you are experiencing technical issues and would like assistance, please submit them through the Q&A option, which should be visible to you at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You are welcome to post your questions for the panelists at any time, but please note we'll save all of them for the Q&A period at the end of the session. My introductions will be brief since full links to bios and presentation abstracts will be available in the chat. The first speaker is Dr. Dagmar Vernitznig. Dr. Vernitznig is an associate professor at the University of Ljubljana and a senior research fellow for an ERC advanced grant with the project IRENE, Post-War Transitions in Gendered Perspective, the case for the Northeastern Adriatic region. Dr. Vernitznig is speaking on The Enemy Alien, Rosika Schwimmer's Peace Activism in the United States During the First World War. Dr. Shirley Oakley is Professor of Communication at St. Petersburg College in Clearwater, Florida, where she serves as Academic Chair for the Communications Department and teaches online communication and speech courses. Dr. Oakley will be speaking on Jeanette Rankin and the Peace Issue, Methods and Morals of Men. And now, Dr. Vernitznig. Thank you for the kind introduction and also heartfelt thanks uh, to the conference organizers for inviting me to this very interesting symposium. Now I will share my PowerPoint presentation with you in just a second. And of course, hello to everybody out there, wherever you are. Now. Um, as I cannot assume that all of you are familiar with Roshika Schwimmer, please allow me to briefly contextualize her life and work. She was born in 1877 in Budapest and raised in a secular Jewish household of agnostics and free thinkers with prominent pacifist relatives, such as her uncle Leopold Katscher, a close collaborator of Bertha von Suttner. Already at a very early age, Schwimmer attained a prominent and innovative role in the Hungarian women's movement of the Föder Siekel. Polyglot and a gifted public speaker, she also productively liaised with the International Women Suffrage Alliance, hereafter IWSA, organizing its seventh Congress in Budapest in 1913. At the outbreak of the First World War, she held the post of corresponding and international secretary for the IWSA and their journal Usufragi or Usufragi in London. Throughout the war, Schwimmer remained one of the most steadfast peace proponents, igniting the foundation of many peace groups and parties, such as the Women's Peace Party, hereafter WPP, on her lecture tour for an armistice in the United States. She also played a pivotal part at the International Congress of Women in The Hague in the spring of 1915, and conceptualized the subsequent women envoys to the neutral and belligerent nations. In her relentless pursuit of continuous mediation and stop the war at any cost efforts, she found herself increasingly alienated from former mentors and scapegoated by the general public. Her negative image consolidated during the ill-fated Fort Peace ship expedition sponsored by the automobile tycoon Henry Ford and arriving in Europe from the United States in 1916. And here we see the industrialist on this fateful vessel. 
after serving unofficially as the first female diplomat of modern times, appointed by Count Michael Karoy to Switzerland in 1918, and her adventurous escape from Hungary under Miklos Horty, Schumer immigrated to the United States. There she fought and lost a paradigmatic naturalization case and co-launched the so-called campaign for world government and world citizenship with Lola Maverick Lloyd, a social activist and Texas heiress. In the 1930s, Schumer was also instrumental in originating the project of the World Center for Women's Archives, spearheaded by the historian Mary Ritter Beard. Shortly before her death in 1948, Schumer was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Before the outbreak of the Great War, Schumer professionalized and internationalized the Hungarian women's movement and the suffrage cause by being mentored by the doyen of the Dutch suffragist movement, Aleta Jacobs, the first female physician of the Netherlands, and particularly Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the IWSA and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, henceforth NASA. As mentioned earlier, Schumer's international suffragist rank culminated in 1913 with her appointment as press secretary for the IWSA and their journal, Usufragi by Kett in London. However, at the beginning of August 1914, the IWSA office in London already faced turmoil because of Schwimmer's insistent peace activism, and her split from this organization as an employee happened as rapidly as it had come about a year earlier. After some consideration, she agreed to act on the recommendation of the London IWSA committee to offer her services to NASA. This arrangement was gladly welcomed by Kat, and Schwimmer left for the United States on the 25th of August. Schwimmer's hasty departure to American shores was not simply advantageous for, advantageous for all her own mediation plans, which involved President Wilson, but it also served the interest of suffrage parties on both sides of the Atlantic the British National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies and their leader, Millicent Garrett Fawcett, for whom Schwimmer's disturbingly outspoken pacifism had become an inconvenience, had successfully gotten rid of her by shipping her to the States. Across the Atlantic, NASA, not yet confronted with the war directly, looked forward to greeting her as a convincing and multilingual spokesperson for the women's suffrage cause. Kat finally had her way in luring Schwimmer to New York in order to use her language talent in front of immigrant audiences. While the decidedly non-militant, non-socialist Schwimmer, guaranteeing a constitutional, not suffragette and hence non-violent pursuit of the franchise was helpful to Kat before the First World War, this relationship experienced a drastic change with the onset of the war. Trimmer's formerly beneficial non-militancy now expressed itself in a very ardent version of pacifism, and her previously exotic and intriguing status amongst predominantly Anglo-American IWSA members altered to enemy alien. When she utilized Kat's invitation in the autumn of 1914 to tour the United States with Ketchell talks about women's suffrage, for peace agitation and pacifist speeches, this introduced an irredeemable rift between former mentor and protege, and Trimmer's uncompromising pacifism during the First World War by initiating many plans for mediation terminated her international feminist career to a certain extent. In fact, Trimmer's heterodox mediation activism serves both as a para-narrative and pacifist plotline alongside militarist events of the Great War, as well as the meta text for idiosyncrasies and ideological paradigm shifts amidst feminist, suffragist, and pacifist reform groups. Her progressive intertwining of feminism and pacifism during the First World War was not simply criticized by militarists and patriots, but also viewed skeptically by most of her feminist, suffragist, and pacifist peers. For her immediate surroundings, 
her feminist pacifism of endowing women with tasks beyond social approval, for instance, as diplomats, political agitators and negotiators, and of elevating pacifism from a mere observer backstage role while a war to end all wars was waged by the militarists struck people as too idealistic or unreasonable. Indeed, Schwimmer's total peace effort that appropriated tactics and strategies such as grassroots initiatives and bottom to top logistics, petitions, boycotts, civil disobedience, or harnessing the news media was too avant-garde for contemporary audiences and bystanders. Moreover, Schwimmer, although maligned and discredited, aimed to deconstruct gender hierarchies and sex discrimination still persisting in conjunction with armed conflicts to this day. But it was precisely this unorthodox approach to pacifism that appeared particularly attractive in the US of 1914 when this nation was not yet at war. Especially many women, such as the Hull House founder Jane Addams, felt traditionally excluded from regular peace groups that showed a particularly masculine profile and were rather elitist too. Quite selective in character, most traditional peace societies like Carnegie's were openly discriminatory towards those who did not live up to their expectations. Traditional pacifist groups showed minimal attempts to appeal to or accept other individuals and female citizens, blue collar workers or immigrants, for instance, did not commonly feature amidst their circles. Accordingly, pacifist practice and programs also followed these non-egalitarian perceptions. Before the US started to prepare for the war, Schumer could use this lopsided setting to win followers, especially Americans who felt dissatisfied with the conventional pacifist institutions for her cause. Her contribution to the modernization, diversification, and secularization of the American peace movement, so well described by Charles de Benedetti, for example, example, is certainly underrated or even eclipsed to this day. As a pacifist newcomer on American soil, Schwimmer became a catalyst for new US peace groups and the first explicitly political merger of peace and gender. She certainly galvanized the foundation of many to this point atypical peace initiatives in the United States of 1914 and 1915. Although there had been moderate attempts to expand the American peace movement before 1914 by the main pacifist players, social reformers like Jane Addams were still uneasy about joining and the then still European war and especially Trimmer's rallying empowered many dissolutioned citizens to engage actively in peace fora for the first time. Igniting grassroots peace organizations by formerly barred persons based, based on sex, age, location, or social background, namely women, younger generations, or rural residents, truly was one of Schwimmer's biggest achievements. Again, as a virtual alien everywhere, Schwimmer had more leeway and could articulate more radical thoughts than any native, than any native uh, feminist, suffragist, or pacifist activist on home turf. Whereas old style peace groups overall stayed complicit with White House policies and devoted their energies to red tape peace negotiations after the war, Alternative peace schemes sparked by Schwimmer openly called for immediate mediation and an armistice. Although this new wave of pacifist enthusiasm clearly could only have its heyday until approximately the spring of 1915 and then gradually ebbed away with the sinking of the Lusitania and increasing US military commitment, Schwimmer's role in it and contribution to it is quite remarkable. In the long run, however, crafting this blatant nexus between feminism and pacifism, which all other activists had wisely shied away from to sustain their core campaigns, proved fatal for Schwimmer and finally terminated her career. 
as she heartily adopted both isms and flexibly oscillated between feminist and pacifist factions, she represented the most ideal and rewarding target for critique, blacklists, slander, and persecution. With her three months tour from the fall to the winter of 1914 across the American East Coast and Midwest and over 40 speeches, Truman managed to win the sympathies of and inspire exactly persons like Jane Addams who were disappointed with old generation pacifists. Unlike these, Truman was approachable, offering an applicable grassroots model of peace activism via rallies, lobbying and petitions. Indeed, Adams understood the need for grassroots pacifism during the First World War, for she noticed and worried about the her Hull House Chicago neighborhood and immigrant neighborhood that consisted of multiple European nationalities splitting into triple alliance and triple entente residents as well. Quite significantly, her new ideals of peace published in 1907 and thus predating William James's The Moral Equivalent of War by three years, is an early quest for alternative peace practices later displayed by Schwimmer. Moreover, coming from a tradition of social reform rather than feminist suffragist activism precisely allowed Adams to be openly pacifist in 1914, while Kat, and also Kat's suffrage antagonist, Alice Paul of the Congressional Union, both were much more cautious. At heart, Kat, similar to other women leaders like Millicent Fawcett, was a suffragist and anti-war, but not automatically and unconditionally pro-peace. Most suffrage activists understood that their reaction to the war would indirectly reflect on domestic policies, in their case, ballot reforms. A talented strategist and thus chosen president of both NASA and the IWSA, Kat, as well as her personal and professional rival, Ellis Paul, refrained from explicitly commenting on the war or involving their organizations directly in mediation efforts. Particularly at a crucial moment in US interior politics with presidential elections and potential breakthroughs in federal suffrage laws on the horizon, both played for time. Hence, it came as no surprise that Adams acted as the president of the WPP that was founded in Washington DC in January of 1915. The WPP, utilizing the term party in a descriptive rather than a political way, as women were generally denied even the most basic political rights, such as the franchise, was both unique and original. Never before had women citizens attempted to interlock the subjects of pacifism and feminism so expressively and directly. And before the WPP, no pacifist women's group had existed on either side of the Atlantic. So quite ironically, the war in Europe enabled the open symbiosis of pacifism and feminism for the first time, and Trimmer's campaigning, especially as a quasi eyewitness from the old continent, had certainly facilitated the swift establishment of the WPP, and she further assumed the role of international secretary within it. Consequently, the WPP can also be credited with providing the logistical and organizational, and ma organizational matrix of succeeding peace initiatives, such as the Women's International Congress in The Hague in the spring of 1915, and the formation of the International Committee of Women for Permanent Peace, later renamed as Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, or short WELF. In fact, the WPP represented the American subgroup to the wolf in post-war times. Now, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I cannot elaborate in detail on this Hague Congress or the Fort Peace Ship Expedition for that matter, which is an equally complex issue. Um, but permit me to conclude by highlighting some aspects that relate to US women's and especially Schwimmer's activism there. Of the 1,136 female attendees participating in this Congress, 
All in all, 49 came from overseas, two from Canada and 47 from the United States. Jane Addams again chaired as president and co-led the post-Congress delegation to the belligerent countries together with Aleta Jacobs and accompanied by Emily Green Balch, professor of economics at Wellesley College and M Alice Hamilton, a medic and the first female professor at Harvard. And we actually uh, do have very brief uh, video footage of the ladies in Berlin so please bear with me while I'll share this. It's, there's no sound here, it's a couple of seconds. So we have Jane Adams, Alice Hamilton, and Aleta Jacobs in front of the Berlin Brandenburg Gate. So that's it. Let me just go back to my PowerPoint presentation to conclude. There we go. And here is the link if you want to watch it again. The delegation to the neutral countries again was headed by Schwimmer and the Scottish lawyer Crystal McMillan. After all, it was Schwimmer who petitioned for these female envoys to the belligerent and neutral states at the Congress in the first place. And here we have an excerpt of her proposition. Now to summarize and to wrap up, palpably and against major ideological undercurrents, Schumer tried to introduce profound socio-political transformations regarding germane and visible roles in the public sphere for female citizens, many of which are not fully realized to this day. Her dissenting approach to and interpretation of pacifism, as well as practice of feminism, became a substratum for many groups later on. Indeed, the aftermath of the First World War witnessed a certain professionalization of pacifism, as almost prophetically practiced by Schwimmer during wartime. This lucrative professionalization again went hand in hand with a masculinization of pacifism, sidelining and marginalizing women once more. Now a politically and economically valuable entity, pacifism and war prevention became hijacked by patriarchy and institutionalized as demonstrated by the League of Nations and later the United Nations. Even the 21st century has yet to witness the nomination of a female UN Secretary General, for example, but this I believe is material for another talk. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm assuming I'm just supposed to start. So I'm Shirley Oakley, and uh, the title of my presentation is Jeanette Rankin and the Peace Issue, Methods and Morals of Men. This is Jeanette Rankin, and if you had asked me 10 years ago if I'd heard of her, I would have said no. It wasn't until I started to do some research on women and politics that I came across Jeanette Rankin. She was a suffragist and the first woman voted to US Congress in 1917 and again in 1941. She voted against World War I and the attack on Pearl Harbor. And in 1968, led a protest of 5,000 women against the Vietnam War in what would become known as the Jeanette Rankin Brigade. I'm gonna pause here just for a minute to make sure that you can all hear me and uh, see the presentation. You're doing great. Looks good and you sound good. All right. <laughs> well, you know, it's so quiet. I'm like, oh my gosh, what if they're all saying I can't hear you? All right. Two great themes in Rankin's life were the advancement of women's rights and the advancement of world peace. Yet she is often ignored or unknown as the leader of either. 
I'm going to show a couple of pictures before I start talking about her. This is uh, her in Montana speaking in front of the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1917. Here she is and what uh, I found is a rare, is called a rare picture of her addressing Congress. If we look closely, we'll see there are no other women in Congress in 1917. And I did look closely, by the way. I looked really close to see who I could find. The women are up on the balcony. Here she is uh, later in years as the first woman member of Congress addressing the Naval Affairs Committee for the House. I'm gonna go over a couple of points before I give you more information. Long before public opinion polls told us that women in the United States tend to favor peaceful solutions to world problems more than men, Jeanette Franken had come to this singular and powerful conclusion. She advocated for both in the 1920s when she clearly stated that the peace problem is a woman's problem and that peace is a woman's job. To Rankin, it seemed clear that women and peace are inseparable. So the issue of women and peace and inseparability combined with what should no longer be called a woman's problem presents this question. Whose problem is it? Speaking in the early 1920s in favor of disarmament, Rankin stated, I am aware that men are disposed to look down on temperamental pacifism of women, which in spite of all the exceptions is a psychological fact as something that the manly man would scorn to imitate. However, there is no other way I can see in which peace can be realized except through forbearance from fighting on the part of men as well as women. Therefore, peace is a woman's job. Her arguments were peace were not only meant to advance peace as a sustaining way of life. She also presented a case for examining the morals of men who served in the US Congress. And again, in 1917, there were no, she was the only woman in Congress. An examination of Rankin's rhetoric will support the claim that not only did her goal call for peace and the need for women to work continuously for peace, her solution for sustaining a policy of peace also called for an examination of the morals of men and political power. So the two main questions I've tried to answer are what moral standards did Rankin believe would forward the cause for peace and how might those moral standards be implemented in a male dominated Congress? So what I'm going to do is uh, discuss briefly Jeanette Rankin's life and politics analysis of a selected speech and then offer concluding remarks. First, let's review Rankin's life. Nora Smith writes in Jeanette Rankin, America's Conscious, that in 1916, the miners, cowboys, and housewives of Montana elected a woman, Jeanette Rankin, to the United States Congress. This unprecedented action astounded the country because in most states, a woman could not even vote. According to Smith, Rankin was a peace activist who believed that war is a crime. Sue Davidson, author of A Heart in Politics states, there is no indication that she subscribed to any conventional political or religious doctrine. She put her faith in rationality, compassion and a level of decency she assumed to be common to all human beings. Remarkably, Jeanette Rankin was elected to the 65th House of US Representatives in 1917, three years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. She was active in the suffrage movement and in 1914 helped women win the right to vote in Montana. And this was six years before the 19th Amendment was passed. She promptly ran for the House of Representatives on the Republican ticket and among suffragists, she was able to declare, the first time I voted, I voted for myself. Rankin won the election and entered the US uh, House of Representatives on April 2nd, 1917. On April 6th, 1917, she voted against, along with 50 others, against the U.S. entry into World War I. She was criticized but was adamant that women and peace were inseparable, saying the first time the first woman had a chance to say no against war, she should say it. She lost re-election bed in 1918, but before leaving office, she amended a bill to secure equal unemployment for women. 
let's pause there, and helped to reform working hours for women. Rankin ran for Congress again in 1940 and won a second term in 1941. In 1967, the organization Women's Strike for Peace joined forces with Jeanette Rankin and Vivian Hallinan to organize a new women's anti-war coalition called Jeanette Rankin Brigade. According to Amy Swerdlow, author of Women's Strike for Peace, at this time Rankin was 87, a Gandhian pacifist and declared that it, had, it was unconscionable that 10,000 American boys had already died in Vietnam. She was instrumental in humanitarian causes throughout her life, including women's suffrage and women's rights, and working at the whole house for Jane Addams, lobbying for Congress, for various pacifist organizations, and working for child labor laws. Next, I'm going to offer some key points of her essays and speeches. And uh, after all my research about these speeches and essays, it's easy to see that um, she opposed war. With this in mind, I chose an address, Mass Action and Its Effect on International Cooperation for World Peace, because she clearly explains a method to change the notion that war is a solution to international conflict. This address is presented in its entirety in uh, the Must Memorial Institute essay series, Jeanette Rankin, Two Volts Against War and Other Writings on Peace. So she delivered this speech in Charlottesville, Virginia, in 1937 on July 8th, and uh, she was a speaker already known for her work in Congress and a pacifist, although what she had established might have been undermined because she was in a, a woman in a generation that did not hold high praise for women in many fields at that time. In the beginning of her address, she states the fears and desires of the masses need to be taken into consideration before social problems can be solved. She reminds the audience that power from government must come from the people. And at this point, it's important to note that women had not been given the vote until 1919. So power from the people more than likely would have come from mainly from men. This establishes her major argument. It is doubtful if we can help prevent war unless we first make up our minds about what we want to do. We cannot help others give up war unless we have given up war in our own hearts. She transferred war as a national problem of a collective power to her solution of individuality, to each heart. She claims that the idea of war is the problem. She says we cannot give up war until we decide that war is an evil thing not to be tolerated. She blames Congress who makes war and in 1937, uh, there were still only eight women in Congress. When Congress votes for war, we have it. When it votes to prepare for war, we are sure to have it in the end. If Congress votes against war, we don't have war. Congress will be sure to vote against war if it ceases getting ready for war and prepares for peace. So this is the problem as she sees it, that in the minds of members of Congress, if war is an option, it will become the solution. It is difficult to dispute her logic that not only US history, but international history has been connected to issues of war in one form or another. Establishing this claim, she explains why men in Congress vote for war. She states, they have war habits, regardless of how much their intellect told them they should not go to war. She says when an emergency came, they voted for war because they had war habits. She voted against it because she had peace habits. She then explains that to change from a war habit to a peace habit, it is necessary to give up an old habit and establish a new one. She states, you have to make up your mind. You have to decide either consciously or unconsciously that you want to give up the old and create a new habit. The standards she tried to establish are of common sense to reestablish the importance of democracy and truth and justice. She clearly believed that peace must be a moral value and that thinking in terms of peace must replace the war habit. In order to do this, men must establish their own values of peace, she claimed. They must establish their own sense of freedom and persecution to establish a new habit of life without the idea of solution of war as a method to settle disputes. While this address does not offer 
an ex a direct explanation for reasons why men vote to fight. In her essay, Peace and Disarmament Conference, she states, half the human race does not fight and has never fought. We know a little, though not nearly enough about why men fight. We must, we know nothing at all about why women do not fight. She, she, she suggests that men fight because in the last analysis, they are afraid there won't be enough to go around. They have deeply rooted belief and ultimately the only way to get something is to take it away from somebody else. And then she claims they are temporar temperamentally competitive. Probably this comes from the primitive masculine way of fighting, she claims, for the rival for the possession of the female. This reasoning also supports her claim that perceptions must change, that traditions are deep-seated, and that the reasons why men have the war habit is not based on logic of the current conditions, but on the fallacy of reasoning that has been passing from generation to generation since men fought to attain women. She also writes in this essay, the most important step towards peace is the will to have peace. Finally, um, I'd like to conclude with Jeanette Rankin was extremely outspoken and courageous in her quest for peace. By abstaining her vote for war, not once, but twice, she established a precedent that would not be mimicked in the US Congress among men who had the war habit. Her ability to see a world in which peace exists is progressive. Her call for peace from men and for them to search inward for their own ideals is in keeping with her pacifism, yes, but also illustrates a strategy that can be exercised with members of Congress today. So to answer my initial questions, what moral standards did Rankin want and how might those moral standards be implemented in our male-dominated Congress? I can elaborate on a method of self-examination for men to look at their own war habit, as she suggests, if that is the case. Examining Rankin's implication that war is a habit and not a choice will allow men to look at morals or lack thereof to prescribe war in a seemingly advanced society. Finally, may the day come when our leadership represents more fully our democratic Demographic, demographic makeup. And may a majority of men and women and anti-war leadership create Jeanette Rankin's peace habit. And may the morals of men and some women, I'll admit, uh, as Rankin suggests, be examined to ensure that peace need not only be a woman's issue. So next, um, I just want to show you um, a little bit more about Jeanette Rankin. This is when she was uh, born, 1880, and died in 1973. She held the representative, uh, U.S. representative office uh, for Montana. She was in the Republican Party, and she was in Congress for two years each in the 65th and 77th. This put, uh, particular link, and I'm going to show you a little bit more, um, Women members by Congress, 1917 to present. I've only picked out her, but if you want this link, you will see uh, the number of women who are in Congress today and how women have slowly joined Congress. Now, I want to stop sharing and uh, thank you, y'all, for listening. I hope you'd enjoyed my presentation. Thanks to, sharing. thanks to both Dr. Oakley and Dr. Vernitznig for their presentations. <clears throat> there are a couple of questions uh, posted. One question uh, refers to uh, Dr. Vernitznig's presentation and it asks, was it mostly for artists? And I am not sure what it is that's being referenced. So if the if the person who posed the question wants to give a little little clarification, it was it would be good. Uh, the person goes on to say Kellner was a graduate of women's medical and private nurse, while Rohr had a cooking school and published recipes for upper class ladies. Um, I was interested in what the speaker knew, as it speaks to the nature of her research approach. 
Beth, my apologies. I think that the questions are still mingled. Um, that's from an ah. earlier presentation. The only one that's relevant right now is from Clara Anna. Thank uh, you. So I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, thank you, Margaret. So the question for Dr. Vernestig, uh, Clara Anna Egger says, thank you very much for the presentation. And she has two questions. The first was Rosika Schwimmer's passivism of a nonviolence, non-resistance kind. How was her passivism influenced? And do you know if Bertha von Suttner was one of her idols? Yes, uh, thank you for the very fantastic questions. Um, yes, uh, Bertha von Suttner uh, was actually a close family friend. Um, she, uh, Rojikas uh, Sh uh, Schwimmer's uncle, Lipot or Leopold Katscher, so um, he was her mother's brother, uh, was a close collaborator of Bertha von Suttner. Um, he actually was basically her right hand in Austria for the Austrian Peace Society that she founded in 1891. We need to remember it was the hub monarchy at that time, and Austria-Hungary was one country. Um, and he also, four years later in 1895, he founded the first Hungarian Peace Society. And Kutcher influenced his niece, Rojika, and mentored her uh, um, extremely. So he, in a way, created for her the symbiosis of pacifism and feminism. For instance, he accompanied her, her chaperoned her to uh, the Congress of the International Council of Women in 1904, which gave basically birth to the IWSA. So this is quite unique that Schwimmer had a, a, a male influence in, in her life. And so pacifism was um, uh, and a, a very integral part of her upbringing and her childhood. And there is one letter that she wrote to Bertha von Suttner shortly before the outbreak of the First World War that Suttner did not witness because she died briefly before that, where Schwimmer actually already um, uh, almost uh, foresaw uh, the First World War with the rise of militarism and and so on and so forth. And her pacifism was completely nonviolent. Um, so we have to understand, I'm giving a paper uh, at the University of Heidelberg virtually in the next couple of days on Saturday, that she was um, an atheist. So she was Jewish born into a secular household. She was an atheist operating amongst religious pacifists, uh, predominantly Quakers especially. So even within that group, she was somehow an alien and she was completely non-violent. And she was completely non-socialist. That's why, why she appealed to Kat, for instance, um, because she, she interpreted, Schwimmer interpreted class war as a very violent form of reforming society. So I hope I've covered everything. I don't want to take up too much time. But Schwimmer was extreme to every, um, in, in, every, in every way. Yeah, so. I would like to pose a, a question to both presenters. And if you could take a moment and talk a little bit more about uh, the, the conflict or tension between presumed gender roles at the time and both women's abilities uh, to affect change uh, within, the, within the pacifism movements. Um, I was very interested to, to hear a little talk about uh, the, the, the masculinity, so to speak, of pacifist movements um, and how both women challenged that. So I'll pass it to Dr. Oakley first for a response. Dr. Oakley, you're muted. The best way to answer, I think, is that Jeanette Rankin was elected to Congress before women, before the 19th Amendment. And so um, her, ability to go into a Congress full of men and talk about peace and to vote against the war was a demonstration of what she clearly believed and what she um, did not want to do. I hope that answered your question because while I was busy getting the video and the, the microphone on, I wasn't quite sure what you were asking, but I believe it was about pacifism. It was it was about, about the the tension created by by gender in the pacifist movement and and how um, 
the description that both of you gave of the pacifist movements being very masculine. You know, how did she work within that tension? And, and did both women uh, either challenge uh, gender stereotypes at the time effectively to push their agenda forward, forward, or were they held back to a certain degree? Well, to continue, um, she suggested that men examine their morals. So clearly there was a gender issue and that they have to look at themselves. And she specifically talked about men because men were mostly in Congress. So that's, I, she just uh, was outspoken. She said what she thought about peace and about the issues and that it didn't have to be just women, that it, it needed to be men too to stand up and look at their morals. That's all. Dr. Vernitznig, would you have yes. an answer for that? Yes. Um, so again, with Schwimmer, of course, I didn't have time to really elaborate on that, but the pacifist movements at that point were really very masculine. Um, I, again, I need to refer to the example of Bertha von Suttner, Alfred Fried, her, her, her collaborator, called her pacifism a gefühls pacifism, so an emotional pacifism. So women had allegorical roles. For instance, uh, in the British pacifist movement, women could perhaps uh, take on speaking engagements like Ellen Robinson, but not really uh, any role that was of executive rank. And Sutna herself was constantly plagued by having no money and having no political representation. Tolstoy, for instance, compared her to Harriet Beecher Stowe as fronting a symbolic cause. And so it was, uh, this is usually not really um, highlighted, um, the, the pacifist movements were really very male dominated, if not masculine, very male dominated. Women at best had the role of, of an emotionally, emotional motherly caretaker. So Schwimmer comes in and I try to sort of tease that out with her quotes about relief work. She did, she completely refused, refused re relief work. Women were pacifist peace angels to knit socks and roll bandages as nurses for, for soldiers. She refused that. She wanted to represent um, roles on diplomatic platforms, for instance, roles that at that point, of course, were completely utopian for women as mediators. And uh, what I didn't mention with the tour through Europe, um, these women met every statesman of high caliber, they met crowned heads, they met the Pope, and the irony was they got these audiences because they were classified as feminine people. If they had been male pacifists, I don't necessarily think they would have gotten into palaces and ministers, in, into ministries, because then it would have signified some sort of political um, leverage. And women were disenfranchised, of course, and as uh, David Patterson, for instance, remarks in his books, uh, the statesmen welcomed them because they could demonstrate some symbolic, uh, some sim symbolic uh, peace, peace uh, wish, but of course this did not percolate through to, to, to any uh, political arena. Uh, so Schwimmer, I, I think was criticized because she, she tried to pioneer things that to this day are not really fully realized that women are negotiators everywhere except uh, instead simply knitting socks and being, being the victims of war, so. Another question for uh, Dr. Oakley uh, from Heather Sharkey, who says her daughter, who was in high school and who attended this panel, asks, to what extent did Jeanette Rankin change gender norms leading up to the 19th Amendment? That's an excellent question, and uh, one that I wish I could answer in full. But if you for those of you who have never heard of her, you almost have to take a look at United States Congress and politics. And I believe she, her work with the suffrage movement more than likely helped with gender roles. And she did work uh, with um, Women's Strike for Peace and she had the Jeanette Rankin Brigade and you know she was outspoken. I mean, um, I'm not sure I would have been if I'm in Congress in 1917, I I'm, like to think I would, but she was very outspoken about her beliefs and about peace. 
and how she wanted men to change their roles with that. So I, again, that's an excellent question. How did she help? Just by being a woman in a male dominated Congress was the first thing she did in 1917. Claire Anna Egger returns with a number of questions and I'll direct one of them back to Dr. Oakley. Uh, she asks, was Jeanette Rankin a member of the WPP? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, she was a member of many things and she was, um, you know, later in years, she became um, working on an advocate uh, program for, for children. She worked for women's labor laws. She worked for many, but I'm not sure about the WPP or the WWP. I can look it up if you want me to. And uh, Clara Anna Egger has a, additional questions for Dr. Vernitznig. She asks, I have one more question. What role did Emmeline Pethick Lawrence play on their speaking tour? Did they develop a friendship? And how came, how come their tour, how did their tour come into being? Uh, this is an excellent question. Again, I didn't have time in 20 minutes to cover that. Roshi Kushwimmer did not Emil like Emmeline Pethick Lawrence because she had been part of the violent part of the suffragettes, even though she and her husband later on split from them, uh, the, the Pankhursts, of course. Um, and the funny thing is, both of them toured the United States at that point uh, parallel, but there were no intersections at all. And both of them, so Schwimmer st stayed at Jane Adams, Adams's ha Hull House, and she didn't even like it there. She didn't get along with Adams. She understood Adams was uh, the best person to be to represent the WPP, but uh, Hull House, for instance, there's this great quote in Schwimmer's uh, correspondence reminded her of her Roman Catholic convent school. Um, so Schwimmer was always very outspoken about people, and with Emmeline Pethick Lawrence, who was of course um, hosted um, in the at the Henry Street settlement in New York, which tells us a lot. Schwimmer refused to go there; that was too violent for her. Um, and you, again, you have in the correspondences remarks by Schwimmer about Emmeline Pethick Lawrence, who is just a private person, and Schwimmer represented herself as she comes from Europe with um, petitions and with papers from both men and women in Europe to plea for peace. So there was a rivalry going on there as well. And sort of the underlying tone was um, the ones, the one, the Emmeline Pethick Lawrence used to be a suffragette. She used to be violent and she's too violent to actually represent the peace rallies in, in the States. So there, the, a short answer to this question, there were no intersections at all, because this is one reason why Schwimmer fell out with so many people over the over the course of her life that she um, that she uh, had very radical ideas and couldn't uh, liaise and cooperate with people from a long term perspective. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Oakley. I believe you referenced um, that Gandhi had an influence on Jeanette Rankin. Uh, was her pacifism altered by her her uh, I'm assuming there was a friendship or, or some type of, of communication with Gandhi. Uh, did, how did her relationship with Gandhi change her pacifism? Well, it, it, she became interested in Gandhi later in her life, uh, not in her earlier years from what I've read. So what influence? Um, I think I, uh, at the very beginning, I mentioned that she did not seem to have a particular politic, political or religious doctrine that uh, in the beginning, she just had her own views about decency and assumed everybody had it. But I don't think she got involved with uh, Gandhi if she got involved at all or uh, what his beliefs were until later in life. Because she, she lived quite a, a long time. So she probably, and I'm guessing, as she got older, she uh, got into many areas of pacifism. But I think, you know, in the beginning, she was already a pacifist. Are there any other questions from uh, the attendees?
I don't see any additional questions. So I will thank both Dr. Oakley and Dr. Bernitznig for their attendance at the conference and their presentations on women as peacemakers. Thank you all for attending and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.